All right, Psalm 35 should be very familiar. If you, even if you didn't get the memory passage done, if you tried doing it, if you attempted doing it, as hopefully a lot of these are very familiar. Hopefully you learned a lot already from this passage. Now this psalm, um, like some of the other psalms, not all of them, but this one really, the entire, so it's kind of a longer psalm, it's 28 verses, but it deals with just one main topic. I mean, there's just one theme to this, and it is somewhat of a recurring theme throughout the book of Psalms. But even through the recurring themes that are very similar, we still see different aspects and, and uh, uniqueness to each one of these and truths that, that they may be a little bit more subtle or nuanced, but they're definitely there. And we see different perspectives even as we go through the Psalms on these different topics. And in this one, you know, just the, the high overview is obviously one of going to the Lord when you have problems with people who are persecuting you and especially, in, like in this case, it's just, it, there's no cause. You have enemies, you have people who are attacking you, and you've done nothing wrong at all. And what's great about this, this psalm helps us to understand what is a biblical way of dealing with this? What's the right way of doing this? And I've mentioned this before, I'm going to mention it again, because sometimes people, you know, it, it's like they want to take psalms, they love the Psalms. It gives them encouragement. And, and you know, on the one hand, they'll say, oh man, yeah, the Psalms are great. I, I read a Psalm every day. It's so encouraging. But then when you get to other Psalms, it's like they want to just discount that as not really being God's word. Oh, well, that's just a song. It's just kind of poetic. But it's, just, it's, just, it's just David's heart. It's just things that he was thinking and saying. Yeah, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, the narrator is the Holy Ghost. That's the author of the Bible. So when you have someone like, whether it be Asaph or whether it be David or whoever is, is physically writing these Psalms, says a Psalm of David, you know what? The author is still the Holy Ghost. It's still God is the author because this is the Word of God. This isn't just a songbook stuck in the middle of God's Word. Like we have God's Word here, God's Word here, and then just some songs that are fun to sing. This is the Word of the Lord. Okay, it's always the Word of the Lord. It's the Word of the Lord. Whether you like it or not, whether it teaches something that, that you agree with or not, I mean, hopefully you agree with it all because it's all the Word of God. But this teaches us how to deal with this and, and what type of responses we should have, what type of reactions we should have in, in dealing with these types of problems. And, and you'll find this over and over again in Psalms, and you're going to find it's consistent. It's consistent. But let's start off here in verse number one. The Bible reads, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. And striving is just fighting, right? You got people fighting against you. And he says, fight against them that fight against me. And the first principle is found just in this very first verse, which is when we have people who fight against us and, and are, are, you know, striving with us and causing problems, we turn to the Lord. Okay, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit deeper later. But the Christian way of dealing with things, by and large, in the vast majority of situations we have enemies coming into you, it's not just to take matters into your own hands. It's not to revenge people. It's not to, oh, well, you're going to do this to me. Well, I'm going to do this to you. That's not the way that we deal with things. And that's not the way we're taught to deal with things. That is the flesh way of dealing with things. That is not God's way of dealing with things for us. We are supposed to be humble. We are supposed to be able to, what, hey, when we have problems, you know who is the, the best judge to go to anyways? It's the Lord. When we have problems, well, doesn't it make sense that you could go to a spiritual father and say, Dad, here's what they're doing. Father, this is what's going on. Look, I'm doing everything right. I'm doing what you're telling me to do, Father. But look, they're just coming after me and picking fights. What do you want me to do? He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. And you know what? You, you can rest assured knowing that he will take care of it. He promises to take care of it. And we're being instructed here. That's what we need to do. Now we see from the heart of the person who is making this request unto the Lord, from that perspective, verse number two says, take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Look, I need help, God. Grab the shield. Grab the buckler. Defend me. I need help, Lord. And I need you to stand up for me. Verse 3, draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. God, please give me a little bit of, of reassurance here, a little bit of comfort. 
Tell me that you're my salvation because I'm trusting in you. I need you to defend me. I need you to get out the spear. I need you to stop them from being on attack against me, Lord, and just be there. Tell me that you are going to save me and be there for me. Verse number four, let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. And this is where we're going to start getting into the, the concept of going to God. It's not, you know, people get confused by Scripture, I think, too much where they think that you just always have to bless everybody. And you don't. And when people do bad things to you and you have people that are just, just causing you problems for no reason, there's nothing wrong with going to the Lord and asking him not only to defend you, but then to like confound them. Hey, don't, you know, screw them up. Get them confused. Bring them to shame. You know, I'm not doing anything wrong here, God. Can you just, can you just do something to, to shame them? Bring shame upon them? There's nothing, this is, this is, you're going to find this throughout scripture. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number five and six. The Bible reads, let them be as chaff before the wind. Just let them, you know, blow away. Just, just get out of here. And let the angel of the Lord chase them. God, send an angel to go chase them away. Let their way be dark and slippery. Dark, they can't see, and slippery because they want them to fall. Right? Let their way be dark. Let them go and stumble and trip and fall in the dark and not know where they're going and be confused. And let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Going to God and asking for God, hey, they're persecuting me. God, you persecute them. But you know what he's not doing is he's not running to his friends. He's not running to his church and saying, hey, we're going to go after these guys because they're coming after us. You put it all in the Lord's hand. And you know what? You can never go wrong with that. See, sometimes man can screw up judgment. Man can do things and go overboard, right? And do, th you know, you, that, you, you, see, you see how gangs operate. You know, one person offend, you know, offends this gang, and then if they're always trying to do more and more retribution back and forth, and so you get these wars going on and people dying, and ultimately it's, it's all just for pride anyways. But when you have the attitude, like, just let God deal with it. And he'll deal with it righteously. Whatever the right judgment is, he'll do it. And he also promises to look out for us too. He just wants us to put our faith in him which is exactly what the psalmist here is doing. Verse 7 explains, For without cause they have hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Notice he mentions that phrase twice, without cause. Now, obviously, people who are going to be digging a pit, they're going to have a reason. But <laughs> this isn't saying like, well, I just think I'm just going to do this today. No, they have a reason. But they don't have a real reason. It's not a legitimate reason. So when he says without cause, it means there's no legitimate. I didn't really do anything to them. If you'd ask them, oh man, that guy, he's this and he's that, and they're going to have all these reasons, right? All these causes to harm him. If you'd ask the Pharisees, why did they, you know, crucify Jesus Christ? Well, they had lots of reasons, but didn't they crucify him without cause? I mean, wasn't the son of man sinless? and perfect and did all always those things that please the father so they had no reason they had what they had zero cause to do what they did to jesus christ in their minds they had every cause in the world oh man he's blasphemous and he's a you know child of the devil and all this other stuff when none of that was true so they really didn't have a cause there's no legitimate reason for it and in this in this verse here verse 7 he's saying you know without cause they hid their net for me in a pit they set this trap up which, without cause, they dig for my soul. They're, they're preparing all these traps. I haven't done anything to them. In Psalm 69, turn if you would to Psalm 109. This goes to show a little bit of the, the mercilessness, the um, implacability of wicked people that are willing to just hurt people and persecute and fight 
even though they've, they haven't been done wrong at all. And what we see here, starting off in Psalm 35, of course, we just see, hey, they're, they're setting traps and doing this. I didn't do anything against them. Psalm 69, verse 4 says, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. And this is giving more, you know, obviously it's a different psalm, but, but he's, he's now talking about people, again, that are hating him without cause, which when you live the Christian life, you're going to have people that hate you without cause. Now, there is a cause because they hate God. There's a cause because they hate righteousness. There's a cause, but it's not a legitimate cause. Right? Hating someone for, for obeying God is not legitimate. There's nothing, there's nothing legitimate about that at all. So without cause, and he's saying in Psalm 69, 4, they didn't hate me without cause. They're more than the hairs of my head. So they're, they're just innumerable and they're all over the place. There's so many more of them against me. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. And then in Psalm 69, 4, it says, Then I restored that which I took not away. He said, it got to the point where I'm giving things back to them that I never even took from them. Like, I'm just trying to appease them and satisfy them because they're just coming after me. There's so many of them, and they're, they're lying about me, and they're saying I've done them wrong and stuff. So he's just like, okay, fine, here, just, just take it, whatever. You know, I didn't do anything wrong to you, but I'm restoring that. I didn't even take anything away from you. And this is a way of, of trying to be a peacemaker and trying to just get through without having to have these physical fights and confrontations like this and to make things work. But you know what? The enemy is never going to be satisfied, which is why we have to go to the Lord to protect us and defend us. Because our fight is not a physical one. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the Bible says, but they're spiritual. That we're in a spiritual battle. We have to put on the, the armor uh, you know, the full armor of God. And all of the armor of God is, is, is spiritual defense. It's, it's gearing yourself up and getting ready to stand against the fiery darts of the devil. And having done all to stand, to just be able to get through it. We don't need to go in and, and demolish you know, go out looking for fights and, you know, uh, the, the Pentecostals hoop and holler and they're shouting at the devil and doing all this other stuff. Look, we just need to be able to stand and get through. We're going to stand up for the Lord. We're not going to back down. We're not going to compromise. We're going to go out and try to reach the lost and reach people. But our, we're not going to go off. Like, I, I, don't, I don't spend all my time trying to get in fights even with reprobates yeah. because I'm trying to reach the lost you know what? I'll pray to God. Say, God, you know, you take care of them. Take care of these wicked people that are trying to stop us from doing good. Amen, amen. We're not going to go and, and get involved in, in, you know, some fleshly fight or whatever against them. We're going to fight against the spiritual wickedness in high places. But ultimately, we want God to help clear our path so that we can just do the good that he has for us to do. And let him deal with judging those that need the judgment. Because he will. Psalm 109, verse 2. The Bible reads, For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. Now, Psalm 109 is a psalm that is prophetic of Jesus Christ. And actually, I'm going to turn there myself because I was debating whether or not how far I wanted to get into Psalm 109. But it's really, really, really important to understand this. I've, I've brought this up in, in other sermons again in the past, but it's this concept that needs to be, we just need to go over it. When you, when you start to understand that this is from the perspective, not just of David, but of Jesus Christ, because being a prophet just like he was being a prophet, he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell when he said, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. He wasn't talking about himself. He was talking through the Holy Spirit as if he was Jesus Christ. Well, in the same fashion in Psalm 109, it's, it's the same exact thing where he's speaking as the, with the mind of Christ. So when he says there in verse 3, They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. It has dual application 
not you know to, to David I'm sure had was going through things like this at the time but then also as you're gonna see this is totally prophetic about Jesus Christ verse 4 for my love they are my adversaries but I give myself unto prayer so he's saying look I'm doing good I'm I'm giving love and because of that now they've become my enemies they are my adversaries because of my love he says but you know what I'm gonna give myself unto prayer that's how I'm going to handle it. That's how I'm going to deal with it, is I'm going to give myself unto prayer. Verse 5, And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. And we need to be prepared to deal with that. That when you do good, when you love people, like the Apostle Paul said, Yea, the more I love, the less I be loved. You know, he says, says I'll gladly spend and be spent for you. But the more I love, the less I be loved. And unfortunately, that happens sometimes. You invest yourself into people and, and you, you bend over backwards and you give them a bunch of money. And you try to help people out and you're loving on them. And you're trying to help them and they turn around and stab you in the back. It happens. And when you try to do good people, it's going to happen. But you know what? We can't let that one, you can't let that sour your attitude to stop doing good. I mean, imagine if Jesus Christ would have stopped and said, oh, forget it then. Judas betrayed me. Forget it then. I'm not going to do good to anyone now. No, it's not what he did. Amen. You continue to do good. You continue to do what's right. Because their evil doesn't, shouldn't make you stop doing good. And you may get rewarded evil for good. It's going to happen. In hatred for love. Verse number 6 here in Psalm 109 says, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. So now we're talking about the cursing of a person who, look, I've loved them, but they hated me. I'm trying to do good to them. They're doing evil to me, right? Every time I'm trying to do something good, they're, they're coming back and doing bad. So God, let Satan stand at his right hand. Give him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul may be saved. But let's keep reading here. Verse number seven, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Now we're starting to get really in, you know, in, into much more of the serious cursing, starting with Satan being at his right hand and then saying, you know what? When he's judged, let him be condemned. Go ahead. Don't have mercy on him. Let his prayer, his prayer, calling out to God and asking for something, let that become a sin unto him. Oh, now you're going to ask me for something? And let that be a sin. Verse 8, this is how we know he's talking about that. This is in reference to Judas Iscariot. This is quoted in the New Testament. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Which is a quotation from the book of Acts when they were replacing Judas Iscariot who fell by transgression and they replaced him with Matthias. That this is quoted there. And it fits perfectly anyways with the traitor and with Jesus being betrayed. But this is the curse from the perspective of Jesus going on Judas and he says verse number nine let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow well that sounds a little extreme doesn't it what did they ever do look this is this is a righteous curse on Judas Iscariot the traitor who rewarded Jesus evil for good Jesus did nothing but good unto Judas he was part of his ministry he welcomed him as a friend as a brother you know gave him responsibilities everything else and he was there with him and even greeted him and embraced him when he knew he was going to betray him and never did anything wrong or bad against Judas one time. Right. And as a result of rejecting that love and rejecting that the mercy, the love, everything that Jesus had to offer and being with him and hearing it and having opportunity after opportunity and still just nope, 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 nope and finally just rejecting it and then betraying Jesus Christ, it brought a curse on him because he was a reprobate. He was rejected. He rejected Jesus and he was rejected. Verse 10, let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. I mean, this curse goes on and on and on 
Like, I mean, don't, don't you give him any mercy at all. And even his children, his fatherless children are going to be cursed because of what he did. Verse 13, let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Like this guy, it's going to be like he never existed on the earth. Don't give him any children to bring, to keep his name going throughout the generations. Just stamp it out altogether. Let his posterity be cut off and, and be done with them. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth because that he remembered not to show mercy but persecuted the poor and needy man that he might even slay the broken in heart. And you can read, I'm not going to keep going on because I already read a lot more than I was planning on tonight. Keep reading Psalm 109. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But he's doing exactly what we're reading about people doing in Psalm 35. The people who are rewarding evil for good, they're, they're, they're persecuting people, they're you know, persecuting the poor and needy man. You're going to see the poor being referred to in just a little bit here back in, um, in Psalm 35 and how God is someone who will stand up for that person. And God will judge and God will defend the poor and the needy. Let's go back to Psalm 35. But you have to take for all of the uplifting, for all of the encouraging Psalms that you read, you have to take it as a whole. Amen. Praise the Lord for all the praises and for all the, the uplifting, encouraging, edifying Psalms that are in the Bible that just extol the name of the Lord and, and you know, everything else that will give you encouragement. But you know what? We need to have a well-rounded view even for ourselves of how we deal with things. And there is a time for righteous cursing. Yeah. And it's not on everybody. And it's not just when someone just does you wrong. But there gets to a point where that is appropriate. Verse number 8, back in Psalm 35. Let destruction come upon him at unawares. This is talking about the people that without cause are, are laying traps for me, right? Because that was in verse 7. Hey, without cause, they dig this pit. Without cause, they've laid this net. They laid this snare. I haven't done anything. And here they are trying to kill me. They're trying to trap me. They're persecuting me. Let destruction come upon him at unawares. Don't even let him see it. Just boom. Drop a big old rock on his head, Lord. And let his net that he hath hid catch himself. Into that very destruction, let him fall. And, and that's another, you know, I've done this in other Psalms in the past where, where people reap what they sow. And it's a common theme throughout the Bible. And if people are going to take that path of setting traps for people, you know what? You're going to end up falling in that trap. That's, that's the way that God operates. Verse number nine, And my soul, look at this, And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Be joyful when, when God delivers your enemies that are persecuting you wrongfully and you didn't do anything bad to and you've only done good to when he finally comes through and, you know, lets destruction come upon them un unawares. You can be happy about that. There is joy in receiving justice. Verse number 10, All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee? Remember I was talking about the poor person? Which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him. Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. See, no one is like, like the Lord is, is such a great God because he does these types of things. He stands up for the people who can't stand up for themselves. He stands up for the people to defend them that, you know, against these wicked people in high places that have all this money and all this power and that can, you know, feel like they're above the law and everything else. You know whose law they're not above? They're not above God's law. They may get special preferential treatment from judges and politicians and police and whatever and feel like they can buy their way out of anything, but you know what? They can't escape the judgment of the Lord. And no matter how small the person is that they think that they could just step on and destroy and persecute and laugh about it and not care who didn't do anything to them, if that person has the Lord on their side, there's nothing that they can do. I don't care if you're the richest person in the world, if you're one of these, you know, 
oligarchs that are controlling the whole new world order and have all the power of the world and you're right under satan himself one of his minions of being powerful in this world you know what that's nothing compared to the power of god and we need to remember that because we're going to be the ones on the receiving end of having things done wrong to us against forces against foes that seem to be really, really powerful and really strong. And that are. And as we saw in, um, as I read for you in Psalm 69, you know, they're more than the hair of my head. There's just, there's so many of them out there. And they seem so strong and so powerful and they can just get away with anything. But you know what? Don't forget who God is. Don't forget the Lord is on your side. And that should give you the joy and the comfort that you need to get through and to, um, to continue. Verse number 11, false witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. These false witnesses are come up. They're making up lies that are so bad. He's just like, I don't even know what they're talking about. Right? Things I didn't even know. Like, it's not a, just making random stuff up. But again, that's going to happen. False witnesses rise up. I don't even know what they're saying about me. They just, they just go and they secretly, you know, tell tales and, and lies. I don't even know what they're saying. I don't even know what lies they're bringing up. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. And there it is again here in this, in this Psalm, Psalm 35. We're getting rewarded evil for good. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 13, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. And that ought to be a stern warning for people who, who are, you know, considering doing harm to people. I wish the world can hear, you know, our culture, at least here in, in, in this country, you know, unfortunately, the, the schools and the culture and society has just drifted farther and farther and farther away from God's word. Because, I mean, even people who aren't saved but can still have some reverence for the word of the Lord, that's not a hard verse to understand. I know that the, the natural man receiveth not the things of God that are spiritually discerned, but whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house, not a very difficult concept to understand. That's, right. That's something that anybody can understand. <laughs> hey, look, if you're going to do bad to people that are just good people that didn't do you any wrong, then, don't, then you better expect bad things to happen to you. And evil is not going to depart from your house. Verse number 13, the Bible says, but as for me, and, and see, this is, this is the attitude that he had. He, he brought up all these things that his enemies are doing to him and how they've been persecuting him and everything else. He says, as for me, when they were sick, so this is prior to them persecuting him, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I was grieving with them. I was taking it seriously. When they were sick, man, I'm praying for them. I'm humbling myself. I'm, I'm wearing sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into my own bosom. He said, I, I, got, I wore sackcloth, ashes, prayed, fasted. You know, I'm actually concerned with these people and I care about them and I'm loving them. That's what I did. You know, this, this is my crime. This is the things that I did against them. Verse number uh, 14, I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. And I believe that he knows that these people didn't like him. They were his enemies, but he still acted this way. And, and it wasn't just an act. He was really doing these things, right? It's not like he was just saying, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. And it's, you know, like, right, like I'm going to pray for you. No, he really did. He fasted, he prayed, and he says, I behaved myself as if they had been like my friend or my brother. Like, that's the way I dealt with this. And, and it's, it's with integrity, it's legit. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. When they're in heaven, hard times, look, I was doing good unto them. And see, this is the attitude that we ought to have as Christians. And, and keep your place here in Psalm 35. Turn if you go to Matthew chapter 5. Because this is the concept of loving your enemies, which we read about in the New Testament. But this is not a, some brand new teaching to the New Testament. But when you understand it, it makes perfect sense on what's appropriate and how we deal with things. Because you say, well, wait a minute. How can you be basically 
praying for and doing all this other stuff, but then also praying for them for the prayer to become sin and stuff like that. It doesn't, you know, how, how does that fit together? Well, it doesn't simultaneously. What he's bringing up here is that prior to all of these attacks and everything else that was going on, he's like, you know what? They were my enemies. They were my adversaries, but I was doing good to them. I was helping them. I was, I was praying for them. I didn't do anything to give them any provocation. But when they start laying traps for you and setting these nets for you, then you don't have to just be doing good unto them like, and just blessing them. Jesus wasn't blessing the Pharisees that were conspiring to put him to death. He wasn't saying, oh, bless you, my son. Now, he didn't do anything wrong to them. He wasn't harming them. But you can see when he's calling out the reprobates as being children of the devil, he's not blessing them. People who hadn't gone that far yet into persecution, yet still could be considered as enemies, them he would pray for. Why? Because you want them to get saved. You want them to, you know... But when you, when you take it to the point of, of, man, I didn't do anything to them and they're laying traps for me, that's the point where you could say, you know what, I'm not going to be doing all this prayer and fasting and stuff for you anymore. <laughs> now it's going to be God, deliver me, and let them be confounded, let them be ashamed, let them fall into their own trap, right? Now it's God, judge them. Yeah. It's consistent, it all, it, it, and it makes sense. Doesn't it? So if you've ever been confused by that, like, well, what, do you, you know, what does this mean? Because people have taken this to too far of an extreme. If you're in Matthew 5, look at verse 43. The Bible says, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now, first of all, and I pointed this out when we went through the book of Matthew, there are some of the things that Jesus says in Matthew 5 that are in the Old Testament. Like, it's written. He says, you know, it's written that this or whatever. And there's, there's laws that'll bring up and then he kind of expands on that and just expounds on that and just makes it like even more applicable. But in this case, he says, you've heard that it's been said. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt hate thine enemy. It says thou shalt love thy neighbor, but the Bible doesn't say and hate your enemy. It's not in there. Thou shalt love thy neighbor is. So people would say this. But Jesus was correcting them. He says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Okay? And this is the right attitude to have. You can, fa you can have enemies. You can face some persecutions. You, you know, and you can still pray for these people. But there's a, a, a point where it's righteous to where it's like, look, I've been doing good and doing good and doing good, God. Now deliver me because they've set this trap for me and I've done nothing but good to them. And, and reward them what's coming to them and judge them. That doesn't contradict this teaching at all. And just because he says, but I say unto you, this isn't some brand new teaching of loving your enemies either because we already saw, even in Psalm 35, that David was saying, hey, look, when they were sick, I was praying for them. When, you know, he was already giving that example, and not just in Psalm 35, but in Proverbs 25, verse 21, the Bible reads, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. So the same exact teaching of loving your enemies and doing good unto them that aren't necessarily good to you, right, that, that would be your adversary or enemy, is found even in the Old Testament. So this isn't a new teaching. Oh, no, but in the New Testament, no. Even in the Old Testament, it's the same thing. It's all consistent. The teaching is still consistent of, of loving your enemies and doing good to those that persecute you that Jesus mentioned here. So, because unfortunately what people like to do is say, oh, well, yeah, all those laws in the Old Testament and all those impregatory prayers and the stuff that you see in the book of Psalms, you know, well, Jesus said this now, so we can't do those things anymore. No, you have to understand how they all fit together. Because it's the same exact concept here that Jesus was saying, as we see in Psalm 35, as we see in Proverbs 25, and flip over if you would to Romans chapter 12,
we have a harder time doing good to those that, that do bad to us. So that needs to be hammered home. Because our flesh is going to want to fight them. Our flesh is going to want to say, nuts to you, I don't want to have anything to do with you and whatever. So we're taught to, to battle our flesh and do what's right spiritually, which is to, no, we're going to, you know, we're going to do upright and, and be good and do right by everybody. But there still is a limit and a breaking point. There is. There's a time where people get rejected. There's a time where God rejects people and there's a time where it's okay for us to reject them too. It just doesn't start off with that rejection. Right? It starts off with, with doing good and, and praying for people and everything else. But there comes a point where that is, um, and again, we'll see this. Let's read through Romans 12, starting in verse number 14, the Bible reads, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now, recompensing no man evil to evil, that, that's in all cases. Like, we don't go off and, and, and start doing evil unto people that have done evil to us. Um, that's, that's not the, what we're supposed to be involved with. Let's keep reading verse number 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is the overarching principle to live by. This is the Christian way of dealing with our problems. Okay? Is, and what I like about this is, is you see that, you know, God is the one who's going to bring vengeance. So we don't ever have to worry about, it's not like we blindly are good without thinking that, that there's never going to be any justice. It's we can be good to them because we know that God's going to do the vengeance. He'll take care of it. He'll right the wrongs. And the more good we do to people and they're still bad to us, the worse their punishment's going to be. It's going to be that much worse. I mean, that's why for Judas, it was better for him that he hadn't been born and, it was, and, and his sin was greater than Pilate's sin or than you know, just about, just about any of them that even physically carried out the death sentence of Jesus Christ said that he that delivered me unto thee at the greater sin. I mean, how much good did Jesus do unto Judas? Good unto him, good unto and then get rewarded evil for that good. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And then we're still not going to do evil to people. We're still doing good. But there does come the point where you need to pray to God to deliver you from your enemies because, I mean, otherwise they're just going to kill you, right? So at that point, you know what? They need to be cursed. And at some point, people need to be cursed. When people are going around and preaching a false gospel, what does Apostle Paul say in Galatians 1? Let them be accursed. Right, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel other than that you've received, let him be accursed. I mean, there, but I thought we're supposed to overcome evil with good. I thought, you know, it's like, look, take it all together. Take it all together as a whole. Because there's, there's a time and a place for all of it. There's a time and a place for loving and blessing, and there's a time and a place for hating and cursing. It's a fact. And that is consistent throughout the Scripture. Let's go back to Psalm 35. And you're going to see this also. Again, it's, it's the people who, who end up becoming these reprobates are the ones that end up getting the cursings. Because they're also the worst ones. They're the worst ones. They're the ones that are, that are laying the traps and doing all this stuff like... 
Look at verse number 15. That's where we left off in Psalm 35. The Bible, the Bible reads, but in mine adversity, they rejoice. So they're happy about the problems that they're causing to a godly person and gathered themselves together. Look at this. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. See, they're unmerciful. They're implacable. And he calls them abjects. Now, we don't use the word abjects very much today. Basically, it's rejects. Okay, those are rejected. You, the people who, the, these abjects, are, they're, they're rejected, they're cast out. It it's, comes from the same root, that ject, you know, it's, it's like being thrown. Rejected is like, like thrown back or abject is thrown out. Okay, these are, these are the people who are just thrown out. They're trash, the abjects. These are the reprobates. They've gathered themselves together. He says, and I knew it not, they did tear me and they ceased not. With hypocritical mockers in feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. And I, I, the language here is great. Again, the, the, the adjectives used and, and just describing these people, you know, they, they get together and have these feasts and they talk smack about those that are righteous and doing good. And they're just a bunch of hypocritical mockers. So they're mocking the good guys. But you know what? They're just a bunch of phony, stinking hypocrites themselves. And they think that, that they're so much better or whatever. And they're sitting in their feasts and they're eating, and they're just mocking hypocritically. It says, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. And this is a phrase that's used in scripture many, many times. And just so it's not confusing, this doesn't literally mean that they were gnawing on their flesh. It doesn't mean they're going, ar, 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 ar. it's figurative. All throughout the scripture, it's figurative. It's never talking about someone just gnawing on somebody's flesh. So when you see that, what it means is that they're, they're saying some real sharp things against him and just kind of biting and devouring, you know, but not literally. They're using their words and talking trash and speaking all kinds of bad things and they're gnashing upon them. And just like when the Bible talks about hell, there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because people are just enraged and they're, ups, you, know, ah, you know, there's this, but it's not a, like a physical thing where they're, you know, when they say, if someone gnashes on you with their teeth, all throughout scripture, it's not talking about a, a physical attack. I just want to make sure that's clear. I've actually heard someone say one time that, that, you know, that something different and it's like, that's not what that means at all. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 17, Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. And, you know, when it says here, how long wilt thou look on? We need to remember and don't get shaken in your faith on God's timing. Because you feel the heat and you feel the pressure and you want instant relief when you go to God, but it doesn't always work that way. But you still need to trust that he will come in and stand there for you and defend you and save you and he'll be your salvation. And we want to hear that. We want to hear God stand up for my help and say unto my soul, hey, you know, I am thy salvation. We need that comfort and reassurance, but we could know from the word of God that he is there for us. So even if it doesn't happen, just, man, I, I mean, the words aren't even come out of my mouth and you want it to be done, right? That does happen sometimes. We've seen it happen in scripture, but that's not the most common way of God answering prayer. We got to remember that, that there's still, uh, God is long suffering himself and that God does allow and give space to people and has his own purposes for when he's going to uh, step in. We just need to trust that he will. Um, verse number 18, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. And again, he just keeps bringing this up. They're my enemies wrongfully. I didn't do anything to them. They hate me without a cause. Verse 20, for they speak not peace, but they de devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. And th these are the people that just won't leave you alone. Right? It's like, I'm trying to live peaceably. I'm just trying to live my life. I'm trying to do what's right. And, you know, this is the typical, you know, the, the wicked politicians. It's like, you just want to live your life. I want to go to work. I want to provide for my family. I want to, I want to work a job, make some money, 
and then here they come, and oh, oh, how much are you making? No, you need to give me some of that, and you, you know, leave me alone. Amen. Leave me alone. Right. Don't tell me how much soda I could drink. <laughs> don't tell me what foods I can eat and can't eat. I don't need your stamp of approval on everything. Leave me alone. Amen. I want to live my life peaceably. But you know there's people out there that just won't let you do that. And when you serve the Lord, there's going to be a lot more of that. Yeah. I mean, we see it when we go out and try to preach the gospel. Most people, okay, right? We'll knock on some doors. Oh, no, thanks. I'm not really interested. No, I'm in another religion. No, I, you know. And we can live peaceably. Okay, great, thanks. Take care, you know. No worries, no problem. But then you got the people... What are you doing? Hey, don't you go knock on that door. Oh, what do you think you're doing? Oh, you know, I'm going to go call, you know, and, and just, just can't just leave you alone. Like, look, let me do my thing. You do your thing. They don't speak peace. You get people that could get real, you know, I mean, it doesn't, again, I'm thankfully it doesn't happen very often, but I expect it as the love of many waxes cold as we get closer to the day of Christ, that it will be more common. They devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. People just trying to do their own thing and be quiet. No, nope, got someone's always got to try to mess it up. Verse 21, Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, all right, I've seen it. Again, these false witnesses, right? Ah, we got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Caught you outside without a mask. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> off to jail you were doing 36 and a 35 I gotcha look I'm just trying to go to church man <laughs> leave me alone which literally happened to someone in our congregation trying to come to church getting pulled over for you know, whatever stupid thing it's all for your own safety Verse 22, this thou hast seen. See, look, at, they say, all right, I've seen it. We saw it. And then, and then he goes, you know what, God, you've seen this. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence, O Lord. Be not far from me. They're trying to bring these false witnesses saying, oh, yeah, we see, see we, we caught you. We got you. God, you saw it. You know what's going on. You know I didn't do this. Don't be silent. Lord, defend me. Help me out here. Verse 23, stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. And I just want to point this out because we, you know, we've gone over already the point of how Matthew 5, Jesus was saying to love your enemies, and we saw it in Romans 12, and we saw it in this passage as well, right? These, these passages that talk about doing good unto people that are your enemies and, and your adversaries and things like that. But how much of this psalm is not talking about good for the people who are wicked. And how much of the other Psalms that we've been reading are not talking about good for the people who do wicked. And just the Bible as a whole, okay, keep that in mind. Yes, we need to overcome evil with good. Yes, we need to be able to fight against our flesh in that way. Yes, we need to pray for people, our enemies and things like that, and people do wrong. Look, I've got some, I, I, you know, in my own personal life, there's someone that's just not just, just an enemy to me, an adversary that for whatever reason, I don't even know why, and it's not just me, it's, it's other people too. It's not, you know, this isn't even just like a reason of my faith or something like that. There's just sometimes you have people in your life that are your enemies, right? And there's someone in my life that, that just treats me like an enemy. Lying, just whatever, all kinds of different things. But I'm not just wishing all, you know, trying to curse him and things like that. I don't. Because that's not an appropriate time or place in, in, in you know, everything considered what's going on. I'm going to do good to that person. I'm going to do right by him. And I'm going to continue to try to do good, even though they're my enemy, even though they may try to persecute me or whatever and, and have caused bad things to happen to me. But when you have, you know, the reprobate that's trying to like 
get you, you know, whatever, killed or, get, you know, trying to, to get your family destroyed or what, you know, setting those types of traps for you, I'm not going to be blessing those people. People that want to defile my children, sorry, I'm not blessing them. There's a time for a blessing and there's a time for a cursing. Just like when God got angry at Jehoshaphat for blessing those that hated the Lord. Blessing Israel, by the way, for hating the Lord. Yes, Israel. Israel. Oh, I thought we were supposed to bless Israel. Well, Jehoshaphat wasn't supposed to, in the Old Testament even. Read your Bible sometime. And yes, these concepts and these truths were still applicable back then too. Loving your neighbor. That was in Leviticus. That was prior to Jehoshaphat and the kings of Israel. So the teaching is still there, but it, it's all taking appropriately. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're not sure, because you say, well, Pastor Burns, where is that dividing? Like, like, I, I can't tell you Every, you know, the exact specific, you may not always know, or on the side of caution, just overcome evil with good. That is the overarching underlying principle anyways. I mean, you just, just do it that way and you won't go wrong. And in the clear cut cases, like, dude, this guy's just rejected anyways. Well, I'm not going to pray for someone who's rejected. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be more loving than God because you can't be. Right. It's impossible. I'm not going to think I could be more loving than God. Uh, I, we might have read this already, verse 24. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so would we have it. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. So they're basically saying, don't give them the victory, Lord. Don't let them win over me. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. And if you read closely on a lot of these things that these people have, you'll see the attributes of the reprobate in here. You'll see the Romans one. The, 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 that's why I kept bringing up and saying so being implacable, unmerciful. And, um, you know, they, have, they, they not only do these things, they have pleasure in them that do them. And they're, they're, they're actually having joy and pleasure over, um, you know, doing these wicked things unto somebody. Like they actually enjoy it, which in itself is just weird. I mean, if you're if you're gonna like try to persecute and do something bad to someone, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would think I would think that if someone is halfway normal, you're still gonna feel bad about it. Like people who steal because they're poor and hungry, and, and they just they make really bad choices because you know obviously it's wrong to steal, but like they just go out and do something like that because oh man, or they've got this drug habit. Or you could understand that more. And it's not like they just enjoy hurting people and, and doing bad to people, but they, they end up doing it, be, you know, because, again, because they make mistakes and do bad things. That's different than the person who's just like, let's see, I'm going, oh, man, do you see that? Do you see how bad, you know, how much I hurt him and messed him up? And, it, you know, it's like, what's wrong with you? So let, let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Verse 27, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. So he's saying, you know, let, let those that are against me and they're trying to magnify themselves against me, let them be ashamed. But the people who are on my side, the people who are standing up for righteousness and truth, let them shout for joy. Let them be glad. Give them the victory, God. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God does have pleasure when his servants are prospering. That is pleasurable to God. And I love how he says, when the enemies, when the wicked people are trying to magnify themselves, the righteous people are saying, hey, let the Lord be magnified. And that, and that is the key distinction where the wicked people, they want themselves magnified. They're, they're full of pride. They're trying to lift themselves up and, and, and make themselves just magnified against these other people. But the righteous people are saying, no, I'm not gonna magnify myself. We're gonna magnify the Lord. 
Let's make, let's lift God up and make God bigger, make God, you know, and give all the glory and honor unto God. That's how you know when you're on the right side. You're trying to magnify yourself. You're trying to magnify the Lord. Verse 28, and my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Because it is such a joy to be delivered with a great deliverance especially when you're poor and needy and you've got people who you can't overcome in the flesh. You wouldn't be able to overcome in this world. You don't have the resources. You don't have the lawyers and the, you know, all the money and all the people in the pocket and everything else when, when some wicked person wants to trample you. But you know what? We've got God and that's all we need. Amen. And we'll magnify his name and give thanks all the day long for looking out for poor little old us. And seriously, look it out for us. It's, that's, the, the Psalms are great and comforting for that very reason. And let's look at it appropriately. This is, this is all appropriate how to behave. Let's overcome evil with good. Let's do good to our enemies and, and those that despitefully use us and persecute us. But you know what? Let's also be able to identify the abjects that may want to gather themselves together against us that are worthy of cursing. And let them be accursed. The people that need to be cursed, let them be accursed. But those that are just our enemies that we need to love and do good to, then let's do that. Either way, let's not walk in the flesh, but in the spirit and, and know what the spirit of God is by being in his word, receiving his instruction and doing it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great teaching on this subject that you provide us. Lord, it is a great comfort knowing that you're there for us. God, help us to, to, in all aspects of our life, public and private, dear Lord, that we would be um, just dedicated to serving you and, and that uh, our wants and our desires would be in line with your will, whether, you know, whether it's um, through blessing or cursing. Let, help us to be able to know what's appropriate so that we would be right in those situations because we want to please you and we want to be good uh, servants to you and, and stewards of what you've given us, dear Lord. Um, help us, Lord. Teach us. Guide us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.